what is the best martial art for children? What are my thoughts on Sambo and a Wing Chun school that doesn't spar? All of that and more is going to be covered in today's Q&A, celebrating the fact that this channel has passed the milestone of 5,000 subscribers. Let's get to it. The art of fighting without fighting? Show me some of it. Hi there everybody, Michael Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis and I'm very excited about today's video because today I'm doing a Q&A to celebrate the fact that this channel just passed 5,000 subscribers. Now of course I want the channel to grow so if you've not subscribed to the channel yet please be sure to hit the thumbs up, click the subscribe button and click the bell so you get notified whenever I make new videos. Now I know in the grand scheme of YouTube, 5,000 subscribers isn't a lot, but for me, I didn't think this channel was going to go anywhere. I originally just made this channel as kind of a way to promote my school here in Indianapolis. And I'm very excited to see that there are people all across the world who are interested in the School of Self-Defense. So to celebrate the fact that this channel passed that milestone, I asked all of my viewers to shoot me their questions so that I could answer them in this Q&A video. So let's go ahead and get started with my first question, which is from a viewer named Benedict. And Benedict asked, what is the best martial arts for small kids to make them fall in love with the whole culture? Now, when it comes to martial arts for kids, I don't really teach children. I teach families sometimes. But most of my teaching is with uh, teenagers and adults. And what I, But what I will say is that I think that the best martial art for kids is a grappling art, something like judo or Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And the reason why I like those is because I think that they keep them out of trouble more so than like boxing or karate would. You know, there's that old saying that when all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. Well, I think the arts that teach grappling are going to keep a kid out of trouble because a kid is less likely to throw their fist. And anytime there's a confrontation, there's like a fight at a school, the kid who is throwing punches is usually viewed as the aggressor. Whereas throwing someone to the ground, pinning them and controlling them is generally viewed as less aggressive. Um, and so I think an art like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Judo will keep the kid out of trouble and still allow them to protect themselves. Now, the other part of this question is what will, you know, which art will help them fall in love with the culture and of those two, the what I would call culture is different between the two. So when it comes to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you're going to get more of kind of a healthy competitive culture. In my experience, most Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu schools don't have a lot of, I guess, culture as far as looking at other um, nations. So, you know, you don't learn a lot about Brazilian culture in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But what you do learn is you learn about how to compete with people in a really healthy way. Uh, I've always found that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu schools have the least amount of ego. They tend to be the most chill people that I've ever trained with. And everybody's just trying to get better. And everyone's really kind of comfortable with acknowledging where they lie within, I guess, the um, skill levels amongst the other practitioners in the school. And so it is very competitive, but it's competitive in a really healthy way that everyone's just kind of trying to become as good as they can be. And ultimately most Brazilian Jiu Jitsu people are competing with themselves. So they're competitive, but they're always just trying to get better. And I really like that culture in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's not, I don't know, like it's, it's, it, there's not as many egos in that art as I find in a lot of other martial arts that I've studied. Uh, and I like that. The kind of cool part about judo, as far as its culture, is that you learn a lot about Japanese culture. If you've never studied judo, you may be unaware that judo is not just a martial art to teach you how to throw, pin, and submit people. It's kind of an ambassador for Japanese culture. That when you study judo, you learn about Japanese etiquette, you learn a little bit of Japanese language, and a good judo school will also teach you some about Japanese history. And I think that judo does a great job at introducing people to a culture that is not their own and giving them that appreciation for cultures that are not their own. 
So either one of them are good. It just kind of depends on what you mean by culture, whether you mean kind of the competitive culture or being introduced to like literally other cultures. So the next question on the list is actually from one of my viewers from Japan. What they ask is, how do you make people take training seriously and really try to get better? How do you motivate them? For in martial arts, it's pretty simple, I think. You get stronger and you win tournaments. But how would a self-defense discipline do it? Uh, because there's no tournaments and strength is not a goal. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's an awesome question. And I think that starts with the instructor. It's about walking the walk, not just talking the talk. When you have a parent or you have parents, you learn a lot from them, even without them like verbally sitting you down and teaching it to you. So if your parents have a really strong marriage, you're more likely to have a strong marriage because you're going to learn what a good marriage looks like. If your parents have a really strong work ethic, you're going to tend to have a strong work ethic because you kind of learned that from watching them, uh, whether consciously or subconsciously. And as a teacher, your students are watching you in the same way a child watches a parent. So if you aren't motivated, if you aren't excited, if you aren't driven, if you aren't continuously learning and pushing yourself and growing yourself, your students won't have that either. Um, that many of your students are going to look up to you, maybe even idolize you. And you have to take that really seriously as an instructor and make sure that you are providing a excellent example to them for what that looks like. And so you have to live it. You have to not just do martial arts, you have to be a martial artist, even when you are just teaching self-defense. So that's the first thing, is you have to be inspired yourself and that will inspire them because they're looking at you. The second thing is to get to know your students really, really well. Um, a lot of schools might as well be DVD players as far as I'm concerned. The teacher stands up, they teach a technique, and then the students go off and they practice by themselves, and that's the interaction they get with a teacher. So in that case, they might as well have just bought a DVD or watched a tutorial on YouTube because they got no real interaction with the teacher. The teacher um, needs to get to know the student well and interact with the students all the time. This way you can get to know that student personally and learn what motivates them and then target that when you teach that particular student. I also think it's really important to acknowledge and celebrate those students' success. That when a student gets something that they were struggling on, get more excited than they do. Don't be afraid to, you know, scream out like in excitement and like clap your hands and go like, hell yeah, and get really, really hype when they succeed because that gives them that positive feedback. So uh, I guess the, the, the three major things to keep students motivated is one, you have to be motivated. Two, you need a personal um, relationship with your student. And three, celebrate their successes with them and that will encourage them to grow. All right, so let's look at, um, and then also just like, just because you do self-defense doesn't mean you can't get into tournaments. I have students who do tournaments and uh, so if, if you got, if you teach self-defense and you aren't, um, leaving the door open for your students to compete, uh, you may be missing out on a lot of really awesome growth because a lot of my students, um, get a lot out of competing. Okay. So next question, <laughs> and this is from someone named Simp. Sorry about that name. Um, and they're asking a very specific question that I'm not going to have too much to say about, which is, um, they say, how do I feel about the Vietnamese martial art Vovi Nam? And that's my best attempt at saying that art's name that they haven't seen a lot of videos about it, but they are curious as to my thoughts and opinions. Um, I also haven't seen a lot of videos on Vovi Nam. It seems like it's an extremely small martial art in, um, Vietnam. And, uh, from what I've seen, it looks a lot like Kuk Sul Wan, which was an art that I studied back in the day. Um, and Kuk Sul Wan itself is great exercise and um, really great discipline and a, an awesome exploration of a different culture than my own. But Kuk Sul Wan, as far as self-defense is concerned, it's eh, it's all right. Uh, you could you could use it for self-defense, but their their primary focus in Kuk Sawan is less about making you a great fighter and more about preserving culture. And from what I've seen of Ovi Nam, which is very little, it seems like they're more of about preserving culture and history and making a badass martial art that um, 
you know, kind of embodies Vietnamese culture than they are necessarily um, trying to make, you know, the most effective fighting art in the world. Um, so I think it looks like it's probably a fun art to study. But if you're talking about like, am I going to become a, a UFC fighter? Probably not. Am I going to become an expert in self-defense? Probably not. Uh, but it still looks like it's a fun art. It looks really cool. Okay, let's look at the next question. So this next one is from uh, Ravens Nation. Uh, and this is kind of a big question. So uh, let's let's just go through it. They say, what style do you think teaches defense over offense? It seems to me that boxers are the only fighters that have the simple concept of defense. Defense such as slipping, bobbing, weaving, rolling, evading, head movement, and footwork. In a lot of mixed martial arts and a few kickboxing matches I've seen, it seems that their offense is their defense. Basically, my question is, what art besides boxing do you think prioritizes defense just as much as offense? Being that you have practiced several martial arts, what do you think is the best for self-defense? I don't expect everyone to be Floyd Mayweather or James Tony, defense like defensive wizards, but having a good defense is just as important, if not more important, than having a good offense. Looking forward to your response in your video. All right, so condensed, he basically says, you know, is there a martial art that really has excellent defense like boxing does? Um, and kind of off the top of my head, none that are as good as boxing. Um, that the kind of philosophy of a good boxer is to not be there. And so if someone throws a punch, they move in a way that the punch doesn't land on them. Because boxing is dealing with so few actual attacks, that becomes a very valid strategy. Because if you're only dealing with punches, then it's a bit more predictable what you're going to have to defend against. So a defensive strategy that involves a lot of, of head movement uh, becomes really, really good. The reason why you don't see a lot of that kind of like extreme head movement in mixed martial arts and in kickboxing is because knees and kicks exist. And a lot of times if you're doing something like a bob and weave on a punch, you may run your head right into a knee or a kick. I've actually put someone in the hospital because they did this, that I threw a hook and I, right after my hook, I was throwing a, a knee um, and they bob and weaved my hook and literally smashed their face into my knee. I wasn't aiming at their face. I was aiming at their body, but they brought their head into my knee. And, the, and I've, I've done this a couple different times. The only one time I've ever had someone like put in a hospital with it, but a couple other times when training with boxers that they use that head movement and then they run into those kicks. And so that's one reason why you don't see that style of defense as much in arts that have kicks and knees. Uh, as far as footwork is concerned, the best footwork that I've ever come across outside of boxers were the Filipino martial arts. Because they're dealing with knives, every mistake is so much bigger when it comes to those arts. Um, it's not like, oh, I make a mistake and I get hit. It's not, I, I make a mistake and I get killed. And so I find that the Filipino martial arts they have, have a much deeper understanding of dynamic footwork and really understanding range better than almost any other art that I've come across. Even better than some boxers, I find that Filipino martial arts understand range crazy well. Um, I can think of some martial arts that put a lot, a lot, a lot of emphasis on like blocking. So for example, like the Kisi fighting method, I've never studied it, but I know that they are constantly blocking, um, you know, that they're always trying to protect their head at, at all times. Same thing goes with Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do is less about just blocking and it's more about defensive offense or offensive defense where you're blocking and hitting simultaneously. And so as far as like the head movement and footwork, that's going to exist in boxing because of the limitations of boxing. A lot of the head movement that you see in boxing would be dangerous to do if kicks and knees were available. And as far as the footwork, I think Kali has equivalent in skill to the footwork of boxing, even though it looks very different, uh, but because but it looks different because they're dealing with different things. At least that's that's from the top of my head. So let's look at the next question, which is coming from the viewer RV. And RV asks, 
Uh, they say, would love to know your thoughts about Brazilian capoeira, not only in its MMA adaptation, but in its original application that includes self-defense situations and knife fighting. Okay, so I don't know a lot about this art. Um, I did two classes of capoeira. I learned basically, I think they called it the Jenga. I learned that. Um, and then I learned this kind of like cartwheel kick thing. That, that, and, that, and then after that, my instructor moved. So I don't even know how I managed to get into this guy's class uh, because he ended up moving like two days, <laughs> two classes after I, I started training with him. Um, and then that was enough for me to set, see that it wasn't really for me. Um, so the history behind the art, from what I understand, so one thing, I'm not an expert on this, on Capoeira I'm at all. Uh, but from what I understand that... Uh, that there were enslaved people in Brazil who were not allowed to study martial arts, so they disguised their martial art in kind of a dance, and uh, and and that's how they preserved the art. And so when you see it practice, it kind of looks like two people um, break dancing really, really close to each other. Um, and my thoughts on it is, is it's great exercise, it's really badass, it's aesthetically beautiful, and I don't think it's good self-defense. From what I've seen of capoeira, um, and like I said, there's like two classes I had, which wasn't enough, but the sparring is more of a glorified, um, drill or a glorified rock, paper, scissors that they do. Um, I don't, I'm not really convinced of this art being effective on its own. I could definitely see that the athleticism and the, um, you know, flexibility that is encouraged by this art would be a benefit to somebody in a fight. But ultimately, whenever I think of a martial art for self-defense, I always ask myself about two people doing it. I say, could a 120 pound woman do this to like a 200 pound man? And I think generally, no. Um, and could a 50 year old guy who hasn't worked out in like 10 years do it? And that absolutely not. Um, so I think it's awesome. I think it's really badass. I don't think it's good self-defense. Um, because I, I, I don't really think that's what the goal of the art is anyways. Okay, so next question is coming from a guy by the name of Heartless Knave. I think that's what that says. <laughs> Heartless Knave asks, what should one do if all the nearby schools are either in general teaching trash, the instructors have a bad reputation, or are not specifically for self-defense? Um, that's a great question. So... Um, for starters, just get into, uh, like a competitive martial art and, um, and then focus on self-defense personally. So if you were to get into like judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, boxing, um, kickboxing, uh, you would learn like probably 70% of the skills required to defend yourself and then to kind of make up the rest, you practice those. So like if you're doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, have play matches with your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu buddies in which you are allowed to throw strikes, you know, put on goggles and include eye strikes in your training. So that's one thing. So if you have any school that has like competition, then, you know, I think that's a good start. The other thing is that there are some halfway decent online programs that you can do. Assuming you have a partner to work with, working by yourself is really difficult, but having a partner, you can learn a lot of martial arts through online programs. One program that I always thought was really good was the Gracie Combatives program. It's like 36 lessons, kind of the core fundamentals of Gracie Jiu Jitsu, and that program is entirely self defense based. It's very focused on being punch safe and distance management and teaching concepts and principles for self defense. They even have a kind of testing process through that program where you can have an instructor look at your techniques and tell you if you're doing them correctly. So you can actually get like a thumbs up from an instructor, which I think is awesome. Um, furthermore, if you have someone to train with, I teach online classes. Um, I teach online classes on Wednesdays and I can also teach private lessons. If you're by yourself, I can teach you, but it's even better if you have a partner to work with. And all that information is on my website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. So if you wanna train with me, just get a partner and we can set up some private lessons and we can start training online. 
obviously nothing's going to beat like that one-on-one -on -one instruction, like, like a personal face-to-face -face instruction. But if you literally don't have anybody near you, I'll, I'll gladly teach you. So just contact me. We can set up private lessons. Next question. So my next question comes from the viewer of Liam. And Liam says, going back to the tier list, how would you rate Sambo, both the combat and sport style, and Kudo? Um, I don't know anything about Kudo, so I'm not even going to mention it. Um, Sambo, I have a video coming out next month about that. Um, the TLDR of Sambo is, I think it's a really badass martial art. I think they need to focus more on chokes. Um, let's move on. Oh, this is the last question. Okay, so the last question is from... Amit and Amit asks, they said, uh, I want your opinion on a Wing Chun school near me. They have no one on one sparring. Uh, they have self defense scenarios inspired by Krav Maga drills. In these drills, the attacker mimics the attack, then the Wing Chun person will mimic the defense. There is no actual hitting. The instructor does the above because he feels one-on-one -on -one sparring distracts from self-defense scenarios. The teachers are good communicators. It's conveniently located, decently affordable fees. But do you, with your expertise, believe this is a legitimate way to practice? No. No, I don't. Um, so Krav Maga stress drills are probably one of my biggest critiques in the world of self-defense. It's what I call big dick martial arts. It is there to make you feel like you did something. But ultimately, what happens when you do a Krav Maga drill is the person attacks you and then they let you defend yourself. And that's not what self-defense actually looks like. Um, and even if the person attacking you thinks they are not letting you defend yourself, it's not true because they're not competing with you. If only when someone is competing with you and they're trying to win, do you actually get the sense for what it's like to have someone try to beat you. As long as that person is trying to help you in any way, shape, or form, it's not going to give you a realistic energy to understand what it's like to have someone try to beat you. Um, I think scenario drills are good, but they are like the second step to a overall process that the way you learn a technique in martial arts or in self-defense is that you first learn the technique in a cooperative environment where your partner just stands there and you learn it. Lots of times you're doing it very, very slow, very controlled, and your partner offers zero resistance at all. That's step one, Co uh, cooperative. The second step is contested. And that's where like the Krav Maga drill style comes in. That you take that thing that you've practiced and you developed, uh, you know, you, you have the mechanics of it down and then your partners offer resistance. But resistance is not the same thing as actually trying to stop you. Resistance means that they are trying to give you a hard time. They're trying to make you fail to a certain extent, but ultimately the they are only feeding you what you need to develop that specific technique. And that's kind of where those Krav Maga drills go and that, and they're good there. But that's, that's, that's the th second of three steps. The third step is combative where you are actively competing with another human being where that person is trying to beat you as well. So failure is absolutely an option. Um, and it's, and it's definitely going to happen. The first time you go from the, cooperative to contested and you move into that combative range, you will fail that technique. But the idea is you fail the technique in class, not um, when someone's actually attacking you. So in this thing, you said that the instructor does the above because they feel one-on-one -on -one sparring distracts from self-defense scenarios. And it can if you spar poorly, but if you've never been hit, you will not know what it's like to be hit and you won't be able to recover from a hit. Um, that's an old boxing saying, that everybody has a plan until they get punched. If you aren't sparring, you don't learn how to take a hit and give a hit. Sparring teaches you about how to control your range, um, and I don't see any reason why you couldn't do Wing Chun techniques during sparring, considering the fact that Wing Chun's origins is not self-defense, 
Wing Chun's origins is challenge matches. When you look at the history of Wing Chun, the mythological um, origin of Wing Chun is that a girl uh, was taught Wing Chun in order to defend herself against an unwanted suitor in a challenge match. That's two people standing in front of each other, fighting. And then when we look at Wing Chun in the Red Junk Opera, these guys are on a boat traveling from port to port, and they would challenge people to fights on the boat. So that's challenge matches. Uh, and then obviously the famous rooftop fights in Hong Kong are challenge matches, two people standing fighting each other. And so if you look at the history of Wing Chun, sparring is precisely what Wing Chun was designed to do. Um, so uh, I would argue this guy's probably taking Wing Chun, if he's thinking about like self-defense scenarios, and shoehorning it into something that it's not. That Wing Chun is about challenge matches. It's not necessarily a self-defense art purely. If you are in any martial arts school that does not spar, and I don't care what excuses they have for why they don't spar, uh, you will not learn how to fight without sparring. No, sparring doesn't look like self-defense, but sparring is the only place in which you get to actually experience someone truly trying to beat you because they are. Because when you're sparring, that person is trying to best you. So if you're absolutely dead set on studying Wing Chun and this is the only school near you and you like their environment, you enjoy their classes, go ahead, train with them, and then get yourself two or three buddies who study boxing and spar with them like two or three times a week and you'll learn really quickly what is working and what doesn't work. And I also think you'll see a lot of what I was talking about once you start doing that. So once again, I cannot thank you guys enough for your support with this channel. I hope to see it continuously grow from this point forward. It's really been a blast making these videos and I'd love to hear more from you. So if you have any questions, go ahead, put them down in the comment section below and I can answer them in a later Q&A video. And of course, if you are watching this video and you've not subscribed yet, please help the channel grow by clicking the thumbs up, clicking the subscribe button and clicking the bell so you can get notified anytime I make a new video. If you live in the Indianapolis area and you'd like to come train with me, all the information you need to do that is on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, I teach private lessons and uh, digital group classes on Wednesdays and all the information you need to sign up for that is also on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.